are duck hunting fanatics. Knee deep in the duck blind. If it flies, it dies. Only duck hunting fanatics know what it feels like to see a brightly colored Drake Mallard cup its wings and soar towards your decoys. It's what we do and it's what we love. Duck hunting fanatics with boots on the ground, eyes in the skies reports. And we get it from professional duck guides all across the country. We interview them for their top tips and tricks from their years of experience from the duck hunting blind. This is Duck Hunting Fanatics, and this is Eric Wilkes. Greetings, friends and fellow duck hunting fanatics. Eric Wilkes here with another episode of Knee Deep in the Duck Blind. Have a very special guest uh, today with us from Delta Waterfowl, Delta Waterfowl, a guy by the name of John Devney, who's been with uh, Delta Waterfowl for over 20 years. So he's got a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of experience, and he's got some incredible information, actually, we're going to be sharing with you guys today in terms of the habitat conditions. Uh, his title there is Chief Policy Officer. So, John, thanks, to, thanks for being on the show with us today. Yeah, thank you for having us, Eric. And I know you, you, you're, you're you a lifelong hunter. Um, you've been with Delta Waterfowl over 20 years, like I said there at the beginning. Um, you know, just talk a little bit about your background, your experience in duck hunting, and then, you know, we're going to kind of uh, segue right into what's going on and what you're seeing in terms of the migration, habitat conditions, and so on and so forth. Yeah, well, Eric, I've been, uh, been a, as you said, a lifelong duck hunter. My dad took me uh, for my first hunt when I was four years old, uh, not terrible far from where I grew up. Uh, on the northeast suburbs of the Twin Cities of Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, you know, my dad was an incredibly passionate duck hunter. Um, so I had, you know, pretty great opportunity as a child to, you know, hunt all over. Um, my dad's probably my dad's favorite place in the world was, uh, and hunting in the world was chasing bluebills up on Lake of the Woods on the Minnesota Ontario border. And um, he had a he had a place that he loved to hunt up on Leech Lake, and so I grew up as a kid, uh, primarily chasing diving ducks in sort of north central Minnesota, and then you know graduated from college, did a few things, and then took the job here with Delta '98, and uh, have turned into a, a prairie duck snob ever since, and had <laughs> had the incredible pleasure of you know, spending the last almost 24 years of my career surrounded, not just at Delta, but my colleagues at DU and the Fish and Wildlife Service and the state game and fish agencies, having, you know, having this incredible passion for waterfall hunting that my dad passed on to me, and then getting to spend time around a lot of really smart people and really learning a lot about ducks. So it's pretty, it, I'm a pretty lucky guy, Eric. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think for a lot of guys, it's like a, it's like a dream, right? Um, getting paid to hunt fish and be part of the outdoors. And uh, we get a lot of guys emailing us all the time, like, Hey, do you guys have any openings? What about brand sponsorship or this or that? Or, you know, you can, you know, do, do you know anyone that I could guide for? And um, we're, we're, we feel pretty blessed and fortunate that people, you know, think enough of us to reach out and ask those types of questions. So, you know, we think, we thank our listeners for that. And, uh, and then organizations like yours that, you know, really get focused in on the conservation side and really become all of us collectively stewards of conservation because it really comes down to the habitat. Uh, you know, I know there's far less ducks and the migrations are far smaller than they used to be uh, 20 plus years ago. There used to be a, a whole lot more. So, you know, the habitat is all more, all the more important now. Um, I feel blessed and fortunate just to be able to be a part of the outdoors uh, and, and like you, um, you know, have that passed on from my dad and then, you know, passed on to the next generation and, and my kids. So uh, it, it's, it, it's likewise. Uh, now, I know you and I are chatting just briefly before we hit the record button and, you know, talking about what would be really, really valuable for uh, our listeners, uh, specifically because we're, we're you know, we're, we're really in with duck hunting. Uh, we, we're, we're, we're a really passionate group. You know that. Um, 
it's the habitat conditions. So, and, 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 and you said it yourself, a prairie duck snob. So <laughs> what do you see in terms of the, the, you know, the habitat, habitat conditions this time of year and what's that look like up on the prairie? You know, it's interesting. The last few years have been pretty huge sort of swings one way or the other. So, um, you know, last year was incredibly, incredibly, incredibly dry just across almost virtually the whole of the prairies. So you had, you know, North Dakota being terribly dry, South Dakota being quite dry, Saskatchewan and Alberta and Manitoba being horribly dry. And, you know, the interesting thing about the prairies is, you know, you don't have to wait very long for the systems to change, right? And, you know, we went from, you know, I wouldn't say record drought, it, at least in the U.S. prairies, it was relatively short-lived. 2020 was, uh, you know, pretty good and wet, at least early, primarily is related to some carryover from some big snows we had in the fall of 2019. But, you know, we were certainly feeling the effects of that drought. Now, as you know, Eric, we <clears throat> didn't count ducks on the big systematic way that the Fish and Wildlife Service has since 55 the last couple of years. But we know, you know, North Dakota Game and Fish actually has a duck survey that predates the Fish and Wildlife Survey, Fish and Wildlife Service survey. So, you know, we knew we had at least one good benchmark, quantitative benchmark of what conditions and duck numbers look like last year, and it wasn't very good. Um, and then, you know, we have a, you know, we get some moisture last fall, we get, you know, I think we had more snow over the Christmas break than we had all of the winter 2020-2021. Uh, we had that freak blizzard, uh, or I hope it's a freak blizzard, sure as hell wasn't a lot of fun, in, in mid-April. Uh, we had good rains in May, and as a result, we've had really incredible water water conditions in North Dakota, uh, southwestern Manitoba, eastern Saskatchewan, northern South Dakota, but we still got pretty droughty conditions in Alberta, western Saskatchewan, and uh, northern Montana. So it isn't as good as it can be, but it's a hell of a lot better than it was a year ago. And that's, I think, the big thing and what guys like to hear. So if you guys are up on the prairie, especially for you guys that um, live there, uh, you're at least in for better, better duck numbers than, you know, last year, it sounds like. So uh, hopefully you're able to get out and take that information for what you will. You know, what's kind of the future plan? I mean, what, what is Delta waterfowl? You know, again, I know you guys are very big into, you know, conservation and habitat conservation specifically. You know, what, what do you guys have going on this year? And what projects do you have that are maybe upcoming to continue to improve that habitat that are specific to the region that you're in, John? You know, I think, you know, I don't think, I mean, Delta kind of does what Delta does, right? And, you know, we're focused, um, when it comes to the habitat side, we're focused on sort of how do we leverage public policy to affect big habitat outcomes. And so we're working with our colleagues at DU and TRCP on a new initiative to conserve the smallest most at-risk wetlands in the prairies, which we think has really incredible promise. Uh, we're doing that same work in Manitoba and across the Canadian prairies. But, you know, one of the things that Delta has been, I think, pretty well known for, especially since the mid-1990s, is our work on duck production, right? Mm -hmm. and, and how do we, we've got a lot of landscapes where we've made significant investments in wetland habitat, especially, that just aren't just aren't raising ducks the way we would like them to, and there's really only one reason for well, there's two reasons for that. One is we don't have the upland nesting cover in areas that are you know really good cropland. They're in crop production, but we still have the wetland resources. And then you have this interaction between nesting ducks and predators, which is a big one. It and is. so, you know, since the early '90s, Delta has been really focused on. How do we complement the investment that's been made in habitat conservation to deal directly with duck production? And so, you know, tools that Delta is deploying like henhouse and predator management, I think 
you're going to you're going to see it. You know, that's going to be a very strong focus for us in the next several years. Yeah. So let's talk about predator management, because I think that is a highlight. You know, again, it, it's it, it's an ever growing thing. And I know specifically coyotes, they've done studies on them where when they are pressured, they actually uh, biologically, they speed up their reproductive system and they actually start reproducing faster. And I know it's, 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 and it's not just, this doesn't just impact ducks. It goes way beyond ducks. I mean, it's, it's really any, any animal um, predatory. They don't care. They don't care if it's a duck. They don't care if it's a, uh, uh, if it's an antelope, a deer, what have you, what are you guys doing to really sort of help that uh, in terms of predator management? I mean, our predator management, Eric's been focused on a very sort of biologically targeted sort of process. And, and we go into areas that we know have really high breeding densities of ducks, you know, stuff that has, you know, 60, 80, 100 or more breeding pairs of ducks per square mile. But those areas that we know generally will have sort of poor reproductive output. And we seasonally manage predators through professional trappers. Awesome. Um, and, you know, the, the results on that, you know, have consistently documented a two to three fold increase in nest success. And it's a very, very cost effective way to complement the investment that, you know, everybody's making in habitat conservation. Yeah, and I think it's important and it's awesome to hear that. Um, I was really curious on that because, you know, again, this is something that impacts us far and wide. So uh, for those of you that, and, and I myself, I mean, I, I enjoy predator hunting because I know it's going to help all of the other hunting that I do. <laughs> it's going to help improve that. But for those of you guys that are maybe listening to this um, and you haven't gotten into predator hunting, I would very much encourage you to do so because it's going to impact any other type of hunting that you guys are going to do, regardless if it's, like I said, ducks, deer, you name it. Um, predators are going to be a constant problem and we've got to just do your part to help kind of control the predators because then that makes all the other styles of hunting that you might do and other species that you might hunt all the better overall. So that's my plug and that's my story for, for today. On, uh, I can go on a tangent on predator hunting and what they decimate, but uh, it's good to hear that you guys are doing your part to sort of help that. And, you know, like you said, the focus on duck production and hopefully getting those numbers up combined with all the other things that you guys have going on. Um, what advice would you give to someone who's hunting up on the prairie this year in terms of you know, where, where would they look? What would they look for? Obviously conditions are, are a big part of that. Weather is a big part of that, but maybe somebody that's new and just kind of getting into duck hunting, what advice would you give them uh, for hunting up on the prairie? You know, I think it's, I, you know, last year we all hated the drought and, you know, it was so bad that, I mean, we just had a heck of a lot fewer places, A, for ducks to be, and then for duck hunters to be. Um, it's interesting though, you know, we, we want a lot of water on the prairies because those are the years we have, you know, in a year like this, North Dakota, Northern South Dakota are gonna raise one heck of a big pile of ducks, right? And, and that benefits hunters. Interestingly, disproportionately is, is better for hunters in the South than it is for hunters up here, which is sort of almost remarkable, but that's the way, that's what the data tells us. And, but up here, you know, you can kind of get overwhelmed when we're wet, and assuming we stay wet, um, there's gonna be a lot of places for ducks to be. And, and the interesting thing about duck distribution in the fall in this part of the world is you know, if they have access to those small seasonal wetlands, which may be in crop fields, you may not even know there's a wetland there. A lot of times those ducks will spend time in that habitat because it's, it's where the groceries are, right? It's where the moist soil plants are. It's where the invertebrates are. You know, there are not a lot of groceries in a big cattail slough relative to a small seasonal wetland. And so, you know, it's the advice I always give hunters, but I think it's even more germane in years where it's crazy wet. Guys going to have to put in some road time. 
because the ducks can get pretty broadly distributed when you got this, assuming we hold the habitat condition we have today, there'll be a lot of places for ducks to find quiet places. Yeah, kind of the, the nooks and crannies, if you will. And sometimes, you know, uh, in, in I think sometimes putting in the miles, it means more than just the road time too, right? You got to get out of the truck too and have a good pair of binoculars where you can see ducks flying and try to figure out where they're landing, I think is yep. also very important. And I think good optics, you can't, you can't overlook that because that can save you a lot of time in terms of trying to figure out how they're flying, where they're flying, where they're landing and, and try to discover some of those new unexplored areas that you maybe haven't been to before. And then, you know, there's always the challenge. I know up, up in the prairie, there's, there's a lot of public land up there. There's a lot of private land up there. Uh, you know, know the area that you're hunting too. know where you're going and where you're going to look. Um, you know, I know that can sometimes be a little bit in a, in a challenge of itself. Um, are you guys doing any work with landowners specifically up, up in that area? Um, we're working a lot in terms of finding incentives to conserve those small at-risk mm -hmm. wetlands, but that's mainly a breeding ground strategy. I mean, sure. one of the things, you know, we're starting to turn our attention towards the 2023 Farm Bill, and one of the big opportunities yep. in the Farm Bill is a program that the Natural Resource Conservation Service, the USDA, runs called the Voluntary Pub VPA HIP, Voluntary Public Access Habitat Improvement Program, which provides block grants to the states to create these walk-in areas for um, walk-in walk or public access to private lands. So, you know, lots of states have done a great job with this. North Dakota has its PLOTS program. Uh, Arkansas Game and Fish Commission has a relatively new program. I think it's been around a couple of years called W Rice, which is providing access to hunters on private rice land. That's that's going to be a big focus coming up in the 2023 Farm Bill. We we just know that one of the absolute fundamental truism, truisms of sustaining waterfall hunting is going to be making sure folks folks have a high quality place to hunt. And so that's something that we're thinking about every day, every week, every month and every year. So how do we create those better opportunities for the hunter that, you know, doesn't, doesn't have, like, I, I don't own a single acre of hunting ground. I don't lease a single acre of hunting ground. And so I've got to go out there and sort of make it happen. And through either through public, making sure public habitats in good condition, or there's access, new and creative ways to create access to private lands is something we spend a lot of time thinking about. Yeah, and that's awesome. And I know the great work you guys have done, the history that you guys have, um, it's been a huge help, you know, in the, in the big picture of things, in the grand scheme of things to, you know, just continue improving duck hunters. I know you guys work a lot with DU and, and, and the various partnerships that you guys have. And so, um, you know, I think all duck hunters that are out there, even if you're new to the sport, you know, you've at least heard of Delta Waterfowl or you've been exposed to it. Um, maybe you haven't dove into the, the details of what they actually do, but I would encourage you to do so. Um, just check out Delta Waterfowl and what they're doing and, and check out what they're doing specifically in your area. Uh, John, I want to thank you for you know, being on the show today. One last question before we, uh, we head out here. What's your, uh, what's your favorite species of duck to hunt and why? You know, I, as I said, Eric, I grew up being a diving duck guy, right? And I thought that anything didn't, that didn't have ducks, that didn't have feet real close to its butt was not really a duck, right? I mm -hmm. grew up shooting bluebells and ringnecks and the odd redhead and canvas back. And, and listen, I love shooting greenheads just like every other red-blooded American duck hunter. But sure. I, I have gotten to the point where my favorite ducks to shoot our blue wing teal early in our season and green wing teal the rest of the season. I just, I love eating them. I love cleaning them and I love shooting them. So I guess today, at least right now is, um, you know, teal are my favorites, blue wings early and green wings late. Fair enough. Fair enough. No, I appreciate that. Well, thanks for sharing. And, and I want to thank our listeners for tuning in. We appreciate you. Without you guys, you know, we wouldn't be able to continue doing these shows. So I want to thank you guys. And I want to give a special thanks to John for, you know, just, just donating some of his time to hang out with us today and educate you guys on, 
uh, what's going on up on, on the prairie and the habitat conditions and some of the duck production things that you guys are doing and partnerships that you guys are setting up. And a thanks to Delta Waterfowl, you know, continue, hopefully, John, just uh, hopefully you're there for a long time, man. I, I, you know, I don't know how much, how much more time any of us have left in this world, but, uh, you know, over the last 20 years, I know you've probably seen quite a bit. And I feel like, you know, we're, we're, we're in this really cool, really good place, but also in this really interesting time right now. And uh, we appreciate the good work that you're doing and, and the good work that Delta Waterfowl is doing. Sounds great. Thank you for having us, Eric. If we can ever be a resource for you and your listeners, please let us know. Sounds great. Well, thanks so much. And thanks again to our listeners. We'll see you guys on another episode of Knee Deep in the Duck Blind. Everybody have a great day and we'll talk to y'all soon. We are duck hunting fanatics. Knee deep in the duck blind. If it flies, it dies.